In 2018, we did many workshops and also symposia, and uh, especially in relation to the three chapters that we had developed last year in with international scholars, researchers, artists, and institutions. But we haven't done that yet for the last uh, new chapter, which is still undead. And in this way, we are starting here a discussion with this last chapter, still undead, which will go on actually in an exhibition which will open in September 2019 in Nottingham, where we will especially fo have a focus on the UK and the relation to popular culture and the reception of the Bauhaus in uh, Great Britain. Um, for this, we, uh, have fo we will focus on one specific perspective that we developed with this last chapter, which is the experimentations with lights, media film, uh, uh, relation to the expanded cinema, but also the question how this has been instrumentalized, these experiments with new technologies as well, in the military industrial complex. And we're very glad that we have these professed scholars uh, in, the, in the evening who will speak about these relations of Jörg Kepisch, in example, who uh, was uh, the founder of the Center for Advanced Visual uh, Studies in, at the MIT, and how uh, others, uh, also Charles and Ray Eames, uh, were using the kind of ideas of expanded cinema in an uh, ideolo ideological framework. So we are very pleased that this will be hosted by Chris Christian Hiller. Christian Hiller is, uh, as a moderator, he is uh, one of our long-term collaborators, uh, himself a film uh, um, theorist, film historian, is it right, Christian? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also a specialist really on Bauhaus uh, histories. He has done several exhibitions on film and uh, uh, photography, but also on the uh, Bauhaus stage. So he is really somebody who helped us also to conceptualize this uh, chapter and will moderate this last panel. And as Grant will speak about the two following panels, I will actually again go into the afternoon because there is another uh, haunting question that uh, was uh, when we, we, we started to do the research because we are today work with concepts of globality or maybe concept of worlding by Iva Ong, where we think about a society which actually emerges through processes of worlding and we're asking what kind of surpluses these globalities create and what kind of other concepts of culture. But what is it when we now look at the Bauhaus, because this is a very diff different time frame. It's actually internationalism. It's a specific bourgeois cosmopolitanism that was in place. But there's also a reception of the Bauhaus, which also really dis uh, put the communist internationalist and the socialist internationalist in the margins. And how we then relate today with the background of other thinking through of internationalism from pan-Africanism, tree-continentalism, and non-aligned movement. How do we relate today to this kind of concept of internationalism? So this will be part of our uh, um, <clears throat> rethinking internationalism. And I think there is also something which we have to kind of reconfigurate in our own thinking. Maybe synapses will change uh, after this uh, conference a little bit. So I hope. So we're jumping a bit from panel to panel, but uh, so I'll go on to the uh, panel where we look at how to address practices of cultural appropriation. And this, this panel is concerned with the, the key question in, in relation to transcultural research, which is to think about the power imbalances that underpin contemporary and historical transmissions and receptions of culture, um, and how these movements don't occur in a vacuum. Um, and of course, this is particularly fraught in terms of collecting cultural appropriation. Um, and the convener of the panel today, Susanna Lieb, wrote, put it very succinctly in her catalogue essay, where she said that um, the interest by Bauhauslers in so-called world cultures was an ambivalent affair, to say the least. That's a quote from her catalogue essay. Because as she points out, while this represented a, a, a sort of curiosity to look beyond Europe and a desire to critique some of European culture's presumptions, at the same time, it decontextualized the objects it encountered. And it also failed to account for the sometimes violent and illegitimate manner by which those objects came into Europe and into a Bauhaus orbit. And so in, in that chapter, what we've chosen to do in our approach is to really stay with that ambivalence and think in terms of case studies. 
and actually build on some of the research that's been done for Bauhaus Imaginista, which will be presented um, in the panel Concern with Appropriation. And then in the first panel, which looks at questions of nationalism, I think it was, uh, this was something which came up very strongly for us during the course of our research, partly because during the three years that, that we've been working on this project, there's been, as you all know, a series of electoral successes by the populist right. And I remember um, hearing about the fact that Britain was leaving the European Union during a trip to Dessau, that was one. Another was uh, in Boston. a strange morning in Boston where we came down to breakfast and our American guests were sitting there ashen-faced with the realization that Trump had won the election. And then finally in Sao Paulo, more recently, we left Sao Paulo the day before Jair Bolsonaro was elected to power. So it's a kind of period in which, the, the, as we all know, the nationalist right is, is uh, resurgent. But it put me in mind of a, a quote from Foucault from a magazine interview where he says that the solutions of the past can never be the solutions of the present, but what we can maybe do is think about shared problematics. Um, and, and, and even thinking about the Bauhaus itself, it was already within its short history adapting to very specific set of historical circumstances. But of course, one of the things that sort of menaced the Bauhaus, along with its financial problems, was the continued um, attacks from the right that, that finally closed the Bauhaus down. And in our exhibition, we have a number of historical documents that relate to this. We have a collage by Yamavaki called Attack on the Bauhaus, which was actually published in a um, Japanese newspaper um, in 1932. And on our website, in the same chapter, we have an essay by Rabindranath Tagore um, on nationalism from 1917, which was a year after he delivered a critique of nationalism in Japan, and two years before he opened his school, um, that actually dealt with questions of the national in quite complex ways through culture and education. So I think when we invite the first panel, we, and all the panels, we do it in the spirit of looking at the historical archive, but not to make spurious collect connections, but to maybe think about how we can use it to reflect on today's problematics. So with no further ado, I would like to invite Natasha Illich, who, the curator who will be convening this panel, and the other guests who will be speaking. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Marion. Thank you, Grant. Thank you all for being here. So the first panel, as Grant said, is about nationalism, and we kind of thought to keep it informal. And uh, I will just say a few things about where I come from. So my name, as Grant said, is Natasha Ilich. I'm a member of Curatorial Collective Wodhau and for whom, based in Zagreb, Croatia. And this is, of course, the context and background of Croatia and breakup of Yugoslavia is a place from which I can speak about nationalism. And in our curatorial practice in the 90s, uh, which started in the 90s and very much referred to the 90s since then, so for the last 20 years, nationalism was a kind of complex against which we stood in all our project let's say at least at the home front. And this, uh, this is the consequence of the fact that practice of nationalism, n not only of the fact that practice of nationalism had grave impact on lives of many, on minorities of all kinds, which were always framed as a national enemy endangering nations, whether we were talking about ethnical minorities or any other kind of minorities, Actually, dissent itself was framed as a threat to national body. Communism, of course, as well, or better to say socialist past. And even the history of labor and workers' movement was seen as something imported, first of all from Russia, of course, but when convenient, also from decadent West. And as such, socialism, communism were also seen as something foreign to the national body politics. And nationalism and its practice and consequences was also something that was swept under the carpet at the same time. So that was kind of the context in which our curatorial practice tried to work against it or around it or with it in a way. So one can say, I mean, that anti-nationalist position was kind of a thread always. On the other hand, when speaking on nationalism in this context, 
war in Yugoslavia, which was in the first half of the 90s, was uh, mostly by mainstream media and ideologies, was mostly framed as eruption of some kind of eternal ethnic hatred, very much in essentialist and basically racist terms. And we always argued that causes for war were, of course, tied to economy, or better to say, political economy, and to positions of Yugoslav elites that took national project as an engine for social and political reorganization along the lines of neoliberal capitalism and parliamentary democracy that was seen as its natural companion back then. And nationalism was its necessary flip side, not just a side effect, but its intrinsic part. And this is probably why we are today increasingly seeing across what used to be called Eastern Europe, the rise of nationalism and right-wing populism in experiments with illiberal democracy, so-called. And from this perspective of this rise of right-wing movements across former Eastern Europe, it is fair to say that if Yugoslavia was kind of blatant example of nas for nationalism galore in the 90s, this had nothing to do with the nature of its people, but probably a lot to do with the nature of its socialism, which just to remind you was also embedded in a non-aligned movement, not part of the, not, and the politics was not dictated from Moscow in any way. This is not to diminish the nationalism in the 90s. I mean, just in the killings in New Zealand a few days ago, two days ago, the guy who was right, when he was riding towards the mosque where he shot 41 people are dead, he was listening to Serbian nationalist music from 95, and which in the meantime became kind of racist meme. So, it, this is not to diminish that there was a real serious nationalism, just to put it in a framework of uh, social transformation. So, as I said, uh, what was suppressed in this story about Yugoslavia is exactly uh, socialism and the nature of socialism. And this is what is suppressed in the discussions on nationalism in former Eastern Europe. So working in such context, my only concern with nationalism that might be more than evil or a knee-jerk response to problems of economy and political economy as in parallel to post-1929 European crisis was the, the whole body of anti-colonial struggles which were, often, which were framed often as national libera liberation struggles. But in this context, it is about people, sub subjective formation of people as protagonists of history. And this is probably the crux of the problem between nationalism, people as subjectivity, and of course, today's populism, which is another framework for a nationalism to find its expressions. In relation to nationalism, at least the, what is often mentioned is the question of patriotism, which is in my eyes, kind of coercive strategy most often, which was imposed, you are supposed to be patriot. So I, never I was never interested in this sophisticated division between good patriotism as opposed to bad nationalism, simply because the organizational form is the state and that that national state. And the right of citizenship had been defined as a subject of national state, which with today's right to migration, or so-called migrant crisis and future of migration, also in the light of course of climate changes, this makes the most urgent the task to divest the notion of citizenship and citizens' rights from the framework of national state and territorial democracy. And this is a project that is really not taken by the left. And then of course, when we talk about the state, we are talking about weak state that stands as the kind of card against encroachment of neoliberalism on what is still left under democratic control within the framework of representative democracy as we know it. So what we are facing is a kind of double task, obviously, to work out both new forms and of democracy and of citizenship. So this is a kind of conundrum as I see it. And obviously we are not here to solve it today in this panel in the next hour and a half. And I still didn't even mention art in this relation, 
nor what the complex that we can call Bauhaus has to do with nationalism or more broadly art and cultural production as such. Bauhaus Imaginista, this exhibition as I understood it, was also very much informed by cultural translation, which in its basis argues that every culture is translation. Neither the original nor the translation, neither the language of the original nor the language of the translation are fixed and persisting categories. They don't have essential qualities and are constantly transformed. This is the position from which this panel will look at several case studies to try to unpack this problem of Bauhaus versus nationalism historically, but also in the light of present moment, or as Grant said, what can we kind of take of history, being completely aware that we cannot ever repeat the solutions that history offered, which were in the end also not solutions. So the, question, the basic question is how contemporary institutions and cultural producer, producers could resist the rise of right with populism and nationalism. And we will start uh, with our first speaker, Mariko Tagaki. She's a typographer, an author, and designer of books, <coughs> and an educator. She acts as an intermediary between the Western and Japanese cultures in general, and between Latin letters and Japanese and Chinese characters in particular. Takaki works as an associate professor and researcher at the Doshisha Women's College of Liberal Arts in Kyoto. And her current research project is based on collaboration with Miss Van der Rohe House in Berlin and focuses on Michiko Yamawaki, the first female Japanese Bauhaus student. And in this talk, in, in her presentation now, she will talk about the collage uh, attack on the Bauhaus, which was mentioned before. So. Please come, thank you. So um, I'm now conducting a research about uh, Yamawaki Michiko, uh, but today she is not the focal point of my uh, yeah, talk, but uh, rather the question how maybe the aesthetics of one collage, or not only one collage, but the aesthetics of the Bauhaus, the photo, photography, but also the magazine design, maybe could have influenced the Japanese um, propaganda design as well. So therefore, I put a question mark behind resist nationalism, as I think it is quite questionable um, how creatives are resisting against maybe political power and so on. So I think you are all aware of this collage. Um, it is also presented in this exhibition uh, as uh, a copy of the, um, of the article which was published in 1932 after Yamawaki Iwao came back to Japan. And in fact, this collage uh, Yamawaki wanted to present at one uh, semester presentation. So he didn't, in fact, wanted to take it back to Japan and uh, publish it there. But the first idea was to present it at the semester and presentation at the Bauhaus. So one of his friends told him he should better not show it, as uh, there might, may, might be like some um, nationalists who will come and uh, check the presentation. So uh, Yamawaki followed this advice and he took this um, collage back to Japan. And in fact, like you, I will later on talk a little bit about uh, Yamawaki and his way of designing, because this looks to me like a stage design. It is a little bit like a theatrical play, and you can see um, the nationalists marching on the Bauhaus facade. It almost looks like the end of a scene and before the final count curtain. So somehow it is almost like in a movie where you see the end uh, scene, but still the story will go on. And somehow this is also the way how I will present you today, like what happened in Japan after 1932 and how designers maybe acted as yeah, supporters of the regime or even trying to resist. So this is uh, Yamawaki Iwao. Um, he came to Dessau together with his wife, Michiko. And it was a kind of a deal between the married couple. So Michiko was a daughter of a very rich family. And uh, yeah, somehow the family needed 
um, a man who sustained the family. And Yuao, who was already trained as an architect, also worked as an architect already, uh, got this deal to study at Dessau again. Like he was looking for finding new solutions, for finding new methods of design. And different to other stories, like normally um, Japanese wife will follow the man or will follow her husband to uh, a foreign country. Uh, but uh, Michiko in this case enrolled into Dessau and she studied with her husband. But this is another story. So Yamawaki's Iwao's first report about uh, his life in Germany started with a report about uh, Hannes Meyer, who was dismissed from the Bauhaus. Uh, in fact, like after arriving in Germany a few days later, or a few days after Yamawaki's arrived in Berlin, uh, Iwao read an article about the dismissal of Hannes Meyer. And he rushed to Dessau to understand like what happened and how it will go on. But he couldn't get any information and it was semester break at that time. So he later on translated Hannes Meyer's open letter to um, Fritz Hesse and published in a Japanese magazine. And this was somehow the visual coming with this. Yamawakis didn't only stay in Dessau, but they were quite active. They had a very active life. Uh, they spent most of the weekends in Berlin and they had a kind of Japanese group or friends and together with them they were making um, theater plays. So within this group there was Senda Korea who was quite uh, active, in, an active communist. And so they uh, were, I think, doing quite political projects. But still Yamawaki himself describes himself as non-political or not so political. Uh, here are some sketches by Yamawaki and I think here you can see like how he is playing with visuals. So he liked to go to the, uh, the theater and at the theater he will do sketches. And the sketches he will later on visualize in collages. So he collected the articles about the theatrical play and later on he made these kind of images um, showing like the whole idea of this uh, theater play. And I think this is very much collected, connected also to the attack of, to the Bauhaus or attack on the Bauhaus collage. But uh, Yamawaki was not alone. There were also other people going to Germany back and forth. For example, uh, Natori Yonosuke, who was a contemporary to Yamawaki, and later on, after Yamawaki came back to Japan, um, they became friends, and I think they visited each other, shared materials which they brought back from Germany. And Natori, in fact, was a photographer and worked for Ulstein. So, um, and he was also the initiator of the first design studio in Japan, um, finding a very, very good team of designers to collaborate with him. However, like the personalities of those people were so strong that they couldn't come along very well. So even not finishing one year, they broke up. <laughs> and so the f there was like two teams right now, like a second team of Nihon Kobo, which was um, very successful in making um, yeah, those kind of magazines. So the magazine, which was called Nippon, uh, published together with Kanebo, was a series of magazines published in four languages, uh, German, English, French, and Spanish. And they were presenting the Japanese culture tradition uh, to a Western readership. And the idea of this magazine was to get tourists to Japan. But if you see the visuals and if you see the layout of those magazines, they are extremely well done. So although they are typeset in Latin letters, you can see that they know how to do it. They know how to visualize things. They know how to use the white space. Um, the photography is very great. So you can see a very, very good design, although maybe for the wrong matter sometimes. So at that time, Japan was still dreaming to hold uh, Olympic Games in 1940s. But this dream yeah, somehow finished when uh, the war started. So Chuo Kobo was a faction of the design studio, uh, Nihon Kobo. Like the people who left the first Nihon Kobo found a new um, design studio called Chuo Kobo. And these designers, or yeah, these designers, uh, teamed up together with the Ministry of Railway and International Tourism, and they brought out a new magazine called Travel in Japan. 
It is very similar to Nippon, like having a similar attempt uh, visualizing the Japanese culture, introducing tradition and so on, but it is more traditional, I would say, than Nippon, in fact. Here again, you can see like the layout, very modern, and um, very close also to the magazine design of life. But like, although those magazine looks very great, <laughs> somehow um, the ministry and also the politicians knew the power of design. They knew that you can influence people by showing them uh, visuals or by giving them interesting designs. So this is, um, oh, this was like an abstract of a, a seminar which was given by Shimizu, who was talking about the power of uh, entertainment that propaganda needs to be entertaining. It could not be compulsory. So people need to have fun. And while they have fun, they get influenced, in a way brainwashed. So this is like a very, very natural way of um, somehow sneaking new ideas into somebody's brain. And in a way, like he's quite clearly announcing the program or how it is done. Uh, yeah, similar to the German regime, I must say. So, in a way, it is not um, like a wonder, or it is not really uh, strange that then uh, the Japanese regime started to use the power of design to also uh, send the message that Japanese, Japanese nation is strong, Japanese people will somehow um, yeah, also rule Asia. And this was done in a way also at the Expo, uh, 1939 in San Francisco and New York, when um, Yamawaki was also included in a team which was creating these kind of photographic wallpapers. And in these wallpapers, they were demonstrating the power of the Japanese nation. So um, you can see the photos were taken by quite famous photographers, and Yamawaki was collaging this together in these kind of ensembles. But uh, this was not the end of the whole development, but rather the Chuo Kobo, like which was the faction of um, Nihon Kobo, became Tohosha, and then created a magazine which was clearly announcing the program of Japan at that time. And they called this magazine Front. And in this, this was clearly propaganda design. But if you see the visuals, you see Leni Riefenstahl. You can clearly see um, the video work by Leni Riefenstahl, which was, I think, influencing this work quite strongly. And there was a saying between or among the Japanese designers of that time, don't get late to jump on the bus. Like this was kind of slogan which they used and which was saying, like, you need to be on the right side to sustain your life. And this is somehow, yeah, I think, a great pity of the design history that in a way you can see the fun of designing, but at the same time the cruelty of the message and the cruelty of the whole concept. So somehow like this was a very, very brief introduction into this topic, but um, yeah, it is somehow a theatrical play which is um, announced here and then continued in Japan later on. Yeah, thank you very much. Now announce the next speaker, Anshu Mandas Gupta, who will be talking about the question of nationalism in relation to Tagore's project of uh, humanism. And he's a scholar working at Kalabavan and an expert on Tagore and Santinikatan. He's an art historian and curate, curator teaching at Visva Bharati University. He studied art history. Uh, in, at Santiniketan, at Goldsmiths, and film appreciation in FTII Pune. He was one of the official, of uh, one of the researchers for Bauhaus Imaginista in the chapter corresponding with. And he is also the chief curator for Kalabavan in its 100 years because it was uh, established in the same year as Bauhaus. So please come. Thank you. I just want to kind of uh, um, briefly talk about how nationalism was kind of uh, a subject that was uh, 
critic by Tagore vehemently, and Tagore often was equated wrongly with nationalism. Now even there's a kind of greater chances of appropriating him, but if we don't really attain to his words against nationalism carefully, then there is a chance that he can be misappropriated at this crisis point in history. Two years back, in 2017, uh, when the planning for the Bauhaus Imaginista uh, was on, the two other new events were knocking at our door. The completion of 70 years of independent India and the 100 years of publication of a book titled Nationalism by Tagore. Uh, which was published by Macmillan in New York. In the book, he pointed out several aspects of the concept of nation as cruel and contrasted it with humanism. Tagore found Indian nationhood to be an abstraction in 1916, which was only worsened in 2017, in 100 years. In this nation, I quote, Punishments are mated out, leaving a trail of miseries across a large, bleeding tract of the human heart. Taking the example of British nation whose government as a nation, he rules that it is, I quote, organized self-interest of a whole people where it is least human and least spiritual, unquote. So he is kind of bantering on the point of organized self-interest of a whole people is a kind of business-like relationship with the subjects. Uh, he asserts that this nationalism is a cruel epidemic of evil that is sweeping over human world of the present age, eating into our moral vitality. The present day nationhood would have been considered evil by Tagore, who wrote, when this organization of politics and commerce whose other name is nation, becomes all-powerful at the cost of harmony of the higher social life, then it is an evil day for humanity. In prescient words written more than 100 years ago, Tagore depicts the reality of the politicians of the nation of 2017. And I quote, and the idea of the nation is one of the most powerful anesthetics that man has invented under the influence of his fumes, the whole people can carry out a systematic program of the most virulent self-seeking without being in the least aware of its moral perversion. In fact, feeling most dangerously resentful if it is pointed out. World War I, within which she was writing, writing to warn us, and World War II, when beginning, whose beginning he would see and in the middle he would depart, that is in 1941, gave him least hope or comfort for the term nationalism, which he clearly saw to be the cause of origin of these wars, in spirit at least. As a result, Tagore as a poet and social thinker continues to warn against this evil. I quote, nation is the greatest evil for the nation, that all its precautions are against it, and any new birth of its fellow in the world is always followed in its mind by the dread of a new peril. So that dread of a new peril, these are all ominous sentences that he uttered way back in 1917. Now, right after this, in two years, he will be founding a new institution in Shantiniketan called Kalabhavan. His school, boys school, young boys and girls school called Patabhavan was already in, um, in practice. The recent majority and current all over the world politics and its very significant instance in Tagore's own country would bear witness to this prescience. There's a certain resistance to this crisis of which we all have a fair share was forewarned of 102 years back by this poet. Tagore as a poet and a novelist discovered and explained this concept of nation through his figure aid of Gora. There is a novel, Gora, of the same title um, in 1909 when under the dismal circumstance, an abandoned and thereafter adopted boy of Irish origin gets sheltered in a Hindu Brahmin home, this man, Gora, after going through the phases, phases of communalism, casteism, and religious fundamentalism, comes to a self-realization. He says, I quote, for me, 
There is nothing greater than my country. I am not beyond the pain and happiness, knowledge and ignorance of the whole of India. In me exist both Hindu and Muslim, Now all the castes of India are my caste. So that's the end. In 1909, he speaks about, through Gora, about the concept of nation. The schemes, because for him, the concept of nation in answering Charles Taylor's concept of civil society as being represented often as nation and collapsed with the concept of nation, Partha Chatterjee, one of the best known, better known discussant of nationalism from South Asia, um, talks about the problematic of discussing nationalism via the civil society alone because then it sort of overlooks the state. So that problematic remains with Tagore, but then while discussing him, historians like Ranajit Gua brings in the state in place of nation to replace some of the concepts that Tagore uses. So in a sense, that nation, concept of nation that Tagore uses, already, always already has a state in mind, a territorial state in mind. And that he tried to transcend through his action and his words. These schemes of parallel and lateral identity formations are part of Tagorean project of lateral shifting, laterally shifting the identity, national identity question. In the name of nationalism and racial purity, humanity has suffered two world wars, and South Asia has suffered one million killings in 1947, with the partition and the creation of the new nation state of Pakistan, with 10 million people suffering untold miseries of displacement. In his second essay, Nationalism in Japan, in the same book, Tagore emphasizes the ancient culture of Japan more than its nationhood. Uh, perhaps because of this setback that he perhaps suffered uh, during his encounter in Japan. In this lecture, Tagore questions European values of science and modernity and expresses his own idea of modernity. He says, true modernism is freedom of mind, not slavery of taste. It is independent of thought and action, not tutelage under European schoolmasters. It is science, but not its wrong application in life. In his third lecture, Nationalism in India, Tagore opines that the real problem of India is not political, but social. Here he comes closer to Ambedkar's idea on the Indian society. You will not forget that he had done a couple of plays, one of them being Chandalika, which sort of um, talks about in a very active way, um, how the casteism vexes the relationship in human society, especially a gendered relationship in human society. Tagore rejects the idea of national history even. I quote, there is only one history, the history of man. Man is a generic term for humanism. All national histories are merely chapters in the larger one and we are content in India to suffer for such a cause. In the Indian context too, Tego came heavily on national jingoism. I quote, nationalism is a great menace. It is the particular thing which for years has been the bottom of India's troubles. And in as much as we have been ruled and dominated by a nation that is strictly political in its attitude, we have tried to develop within ourselves, despite our inheritance from the past, a belief in our eventual political destiny. Tego questions the idea of political nation. If it does not bring freedom of mind, he says political freedom does not give us freedom when our mind is not free. Just note those points of mind is not free. Tego's book is a bold, rational, human critique of the idea of nationalism, which has caused so many misery in the world and continues to do so. Now he gives an off, he offers a choice. Tego raises the fundamental question, does world humanity need nationalism or humanism? While there has been no concept of nationalism in civilizational history as such, humanity had crossed various stages of life from barbarism to cultural living values, from no ownership to common natural property of our entire humanity, to the highly corporatized one-person property holders against 99% who are deprived of minimum property at the global stage. He questions the Western concept of nation, which holds, I quote, a nation in the sense of political and economic union of the people is that 
aspect which a whole population assumes when organized for a mechanical purpose. Society as such has no ulterior purpose. It is an end in itself. It is a spontaneous expression of man as a social being. It is a natural regulation of human relationship so that men can develop ideas of life in cooperation with one another. It has all the political, also political side, but this is only for special purpose. It is for self-preservation, I unquote. Tagore is very clear that naturally built human society is much more human in a sense than the so-called artificially created nationhood. So he gives those choices, whether nationalism or humanism. Um, then as a result, what happens is he founds the school in Chantiniketan in 1919. His founding is, is just coeval, it just overlaps. His founding of the school in 1901 and subsequent and confident foundation of art and music school as prior to the foundation of university in Chantiniketan, which is uh, 1919 and 21 accordingly, form the bottom line of that critic of nation, which doesn't succumb to the statism, but recycles the thought of conviviality by an intimate mode of community and communication. The art school, I don't have Bataille in mind when I said community and communication, but art school means while delved itself to creating a model of every day that is microsocial by the experiential recordings and building inventories and developing a fitting campus aesthetic with materially small but intellectually a very ambitious and challenging school. The school, though through its everyday practices, at least in the initial slides, please. Next, please. The school, meanwhile, delved into creating model for, of every day that is microsocial or experiential recording and building inventories and developing a fitting campus aesthetic with materially small and intellectually a very ambitious and challenging school. The one in view you can see comes back from Nandalal Bose, the founder's Java trip, who followed the instruction of Tagore to collect either materially or in terms of record things that they see on the way of their sojourns to places abroad. The school, though it's everyday through its uh, everyday practices, at least in the initial 20 to 30 years, had dealt to translate this global local project without the fund fundamentals of the nation thinking along an instrumental line, eating into its relational logic. Here, at the cost of repetition of what is vo voiced in my way basically, I would reiterate that because Tagore preferred the term sociality and community to the larger and more functionalist term nation, the others, that is founding figures of the school, next please. <coughs> this is kind of, these are pedagogic methods uh, of collecting and disseminating objects and recording them uh, from all over the world, including the instruments of production. Next, please. Here, at the cost of repetition, uh, I mean, uh, and more functionalist nation, the others, that is the founding figures of art school, uh, Kalabhavan, of Kalabhavan, also collected their experiences as well as material artifacts from wherever they went. They fundamentally from the repository, form the repository of the experiences from which the whole community of that time learned and gained benefit. The postcards, the exhibition registers by Nandalal Bose, uh, among his colleagues and Tego's own letters from all over the world, as well as daily interactions inside the campus formed many, next please, many, uh, you can see the girls atop a tree playing, quite unusual for this 1920s picture. Elsewhere, it should be considered a sacrilege. Formed many such contact points between the learner and the teaching community. Uh, the interaction and mingling with the world at large also started that early by about 22. If you count on Bauhaus exhibition in Calcutta and Cramrish's visit in Chantiniketan, wherein she had shown uh, slides from Gothic to uh, the Dada, Dadaism. Which was, which is just kind of a continuing movement at the time all over Europe. In Japan, your traveler to Japan, Tagore expresses himself uh, in 
favor of pre-industrial beauty of craft and the alienation and contrast that with the alienation and ugliness of the industrial production. So he sort of is very clear about, he's indicating the path that Shantiniketan was to take. He introduces a social ideal of the indigenous self-development through non-alienating alternative art and craft based production line in Sriniketan, paralleling the productions of aesthetic education and model building in Shantiniketan. One may remember in this context Gandhi's ideals um, though when close tie with many of the families, would constantly focus on the rural India, as would be Tagore's, thus building up a different society corresponding with the Swadeshi Samaj, that is 1906 essay by Tagore, which sort of talks about how civil society, indigenous civil society could be formed uh, without the concept of nation state, uh, emphasizing the self-governance of the people before you, you can rest independence. This can be seen together with Gandhi's call for Naya Talim or new training. This team could be uh, slightly loosened up gradually with a pragmatic Sapsaniketan. Now, he sort of gives a kind of, um, well, he published an interesting account of his encounter with the, uh, with the students. And that is, that forms the last bit of my presentation. Uh, here, in 1935, he publishes a book called Praktoni, or the Alumni. Thus, father led to the register of conviviality, which takes the form of the inevitable in a send-off, which, which might be slightly cruel, like you say, you go away now, you have learned enough. And Tagore incorporates that in his lecture, that send-off is clubbed together with a welcome for the future. What remained essentially a send-off, thus in the presence of alumni, becomes fundamental unifying point between the present and the past. A few quotes from Tagore's Praktoni, or alumni, which first edition came out in 1936, may elucidate the discourse. In this unique institution of India, Tagore says, knowledge and life are united. I have never allowed it to get past me in last 30 years of practice. The way with so much, with so much pain, I had carried out that practice that not many will know and nowhere in history will it be written. Other institutions demand salary, we demand sacrifice. I have never demanded anything in return for what I gave, but if you just remember to connect with a being that lags beyond the curricular world and the world of text, that will be your payback to the institution. He, the second quote is from his letter number four. He says, is referring to the past and present and the future of this dear institution. This is his last letter. Was nowhere emphasized more than in the fourth letter written in 1935. He states that he need to remind people of certain things about the school since distance may create a loss of contact. This school was built uh, with many connections, he says. One main theory worked behind that. If I say that that theory is mine and you have to cast it in solid form and preserve it, can you run the, that is not possible. I don't want to create a structure that will stay forever. This institution was built against diverse challenges and opposition. It doesn't know which way to go. It doesn't have a fixed path. When I was alone, my will or desire worked in this organization slash event. That path was easy. When it was thought that it won't succeed unless it is submitted to common causes slash people, it won't connect with the country. Then we had to make a constitution. Before that, we were in touch with the other countries. Many knew about this school. You know that for this school, I suffered many losses, including deviated from my favorite path, which is literary. After Withstanding many slanders, I have reached at last stage of my life. If it turns out to be an inert object, I fail. I don't wish to think that nothing will come out of that gift given. I don't think that all of you will be in my favor, but I hope some will have the empathy." Unquote. This is presumably, this is a mural from Shantiniketan. This is presumably the last of the seven lectures compiling a collection, the world changed fundamentally after the Second World War, 
and after independ Indian independence, and after 1951, when his institution that rested on benevolent labor and loyalty of the poet became part of the state run, uh, royalty of the poet, I mean, sorry, state run central institution. If Tagore concept this as a micro social institution, negotiating modernity in terms of local and the global, the home and the world, in a very locally produced and intimate yet public terms, then that got gradually dissipated, retaining them in mostly public memory and few energetic self-organized efforts. The world has changed ever since. In the recent years, all over the world, there are crises which matches in its tenor, if not in extent, but Tagore, the humanist, and Freud, the modernist, one after another voiced as the crisis in civilization and civilization and its discontents, respectively, voiced the similar anxieties as the illusion of humanism and modernism as they knew it were failing. Bauhaus' ideas crumbled, albeit temporarily, under the same murky circumstance, as we may recall. As to when the people of those countries and the world will awaken from the slumber induced by the most powerful anesthetics is difficult to predict. But the poet's small book on nationalism is a powerful antidote to such anesthetics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are, of course, uh, running uh, late already, so I will just announce our next speaker. It's Rustam Barucha. He's a professor of theater and performance studies at Nehru University in Delhi, India. He authored several books, including Theater and the World, The Politics of Cultural Practice, Rajasthan and Oral History, Another Asia, etc. He was the project director of Arna Jarna, the Desert Museum of Rajasthan, and the festival director of the Inter-Asian Ramayana Festival at the Adishakti Laboratory for Theater Research in Pondicherry. Please come. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by congratulating the curators of this conference for daring to pose such an obvious, yet fiendishly difficult question. And the question is simply, how does one resist populist nationalism? And I would add, today. To be honest, I'm not sure whether the Bauhaus can actually help us to answer this question, but more on that later. I've been struggling with this question for quite some time in my writings on interculturalism. And what I would like to share with you is the possibility, the strategic necessity perhaps, of reclaiming the national against nationalism. Now this sounds like a very paradoxical proposition, and indeed it is. It is directly inspired by a critique of nationalism that was addressed by the previous speaker that has not, to my mind, been surpassed. It's a critique that was made by the Bengali poet and visionary Rabindranath Tagore way back in 1916 in Japan, in the midst of the First World War. It takes a lot of guts to go to another country as a foreigner and rail against nationalism during war. Now, I choose to focus on this historical moment rather than on 1922, six years later, when an exhibition of the Bauhaus was held in my home city of Calcutta with Tagore playing a role, even as his critique of nationalism was not directly addressed. So I'm going to give you a very brief perspective on this exhibition, which I don't believe really answers the question we're made to answer. And then I'll follow that up with a more programmatic statement how we can indeed resist nationalism. So, <clears throat> 1922, let's face it. The affirmation of global cosmopolitanism cosmopolitanism in this exhibition 
was at once unprecedented and, to my mind, breathtaking. I'm struck by the ease with which a correspondence between the curator of the exhibition, Austrian art historian Stella Kramrisch, teaching in Schantenikitten, and Johanna Zitten at the Bauhaus, precipitated, you're not going to believe this, the transportation of over a hundred paintings by emergent masters like Kandinsky and Clay. It would be really hard to imagine anything like this exchange of artwork today. No German art museum or art house is likely to send its painting, certainly not hundreds, to an Indian art society. And even if this did materialize, it would take perhaps two years or more before the exhibition could be realized. Now, this tells us something about the limits of our much-hyped global networking today. They were networking back then, and they were doing pretty well. But it also indicates the privileged and specifically European points of personal contact that made the exhibition in Calcutta possible in the colonial era. Now, my own reading is that cosmopolit the cosmopolitanism of this moment is somewhat overstated and that the discourse surrounding it is not adequately political in its critique. And my position is the critique hasn't really begun. Arguably, the Bauhaus exhibition in Calcutta was a one-off with no lasting legacy of the Bauhaus influence on the Bengal School of Painting. And this is quite unlike the sustained interaction that took place between the Bengal School and the Far Eastern tradition of painting and art pedagogy. And here, of course, I'm referring to the interaction that was initiated by Okakura Tenshin in 1902 and followed by great Japanese painters, Hishida Shunso, Yokoyama Taikan, and many others who have contributed to the Bengal-Japan connection. There is no such Bauhaus Bengal legacy of shared affinities. Second, I think it would be accurate to say that 1922 was a moment of transition for the Bauhaus. And I think we have to stop singularizing the Bauhaus because between 1919 and 1933, there were at least three phases of the Bauhaus. And there was a lot of internal disagreement and contradiction. So what we are dealing with at the moment is the tail end of the first phase. Itten resigned shortly after the exhibition in Calcutta, while Gropius assertively changed the philosophical orientation of the school. To my mind, Gropius's summary rejection of Itten's arguably Tagorean spiritualism and trysts with theosophy and neo-Zoroastrianism in favor of a more robust interaction with technology and mass culture would not have found any support from Tagore. Indeed, Tagore's advocacy of modernism without modernization is almost antithetical, politically, aesthetically, and philosophically to the post-1922 agenda of the Bauhaus, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Finally, one would be compelled to ask, for all its cosmopolitanism, was the exhibition of the Bauhaus in Calcutta genuinely dialogic? Or did it merely juxtapose two sets of artworks from two cultural locations, which ostensibly shared certain values of pedagogy, even as the pedagogies were very different, and a respect for the crafts, even though the economic foundations of the crafts are very different? The point is, there was no real manifesto of shared affinities or differences between the Bauhaus and the Bengal school. The contemporary art historian Topati Guatakurta reminds us that for all the hype that now surrounds the Bauhaus exhibition in Calcutta, it was a relatively small show for an elite constituency with almost no impact in public culture at large. Not much was known until very recently of the lesser known Bengali artists participating in the show. They didn't seem to matter. As for its marketing success, just one artwork was sold and the rest of the paintings were returned to Germany in record time, 
countering the myth that these Bauhaus works were circulating underground in Calcutta and feeding the political unconscious of the Bengali imaginary, which is a load of nonsense. <laughs> Likewise, it is necessary to point out that after the exhibition in Calcutta, the Bauhaus never quite returned to its quasi-Orientalist cult of India. It was a forgotten chapter in its history as it shifted its priorities decisively and pragmatically in favor of technology, design, and media. Okay. So, I provide this very brief background of the 1922 Bauhaus exhibition to say that while it may have provided an oblique critique of Bengali provincialism, academicism, revivalism in the art world, it did nothing to critique or resist nationalism as such. At a broader level, and this is a tougher area, I would question to what extent the larger phenomenon of the Bauhaus provides us with any agenda or set of strategies that could enable us to resist nationalism today. If anything, the Bauhaus teaches us how one can survive nationalism through emigration, negotiations and collusions with corporate capitalism, industry, and the privileges of the Ivy League. While we are all beneficiaries of its extraordinary legacy, which I love, let us be realistic and not impose any false assumption that the Bauhaus can help us to resist nationalism today. Now, <clears throat> let me focus on the key question. How does one resist populist nationalism? And here I go back to 1916 and the critique of nationalism put forward by Tagore in Japan. Addressing his rapt audiences, Tagore told them in plain terms that if they pursued what he called the self-idolatry of nation worship, they would only succeed in destroying themselves. Tagore saw nothing good in the idea of nationalism. He associated it with soul-denying mechanisms relating to the apparatus of the nation state. He saw it directly linked to racism and xenophobia. And with great prescience, he was able to see how nationalists mobilized technologies of surveillance for what he called the protection of state secrets. I do believe that he had anticipated much of what we fear about living with nationalism today. Significantly, he did nothing to soften his critique. He did not negotiate the idea of nationalism. He did not, for instance, make a distinction between good nationalism and bad nationalism, which Natasha had pointed out, how bogus that can be. Nor did he differentiate between civic nationalism and ethnic nationalism. I think he was aware of these distinctions, but he didn't want to make them. He's not a social scientist. He's a poet. He's an artist. Instead, he rejected the idea of nationalism outright. How liberating. But it's also challenging and also paradoxical. Because how, and this is the key question, how can one reconcile Tagore's anti-nationalism with the fact that he is our most beloved national poet in India, and for God's sake, the composer of our national anthem? Indeed, he is the composer of Bangladesh's national anthem, and I do believe that he had some influence on the composition of Sri Lanka's national anthem as well. A triple whammy, as you might say. Now, with such patriotic credentials, how does one begin to make sense of his rejection of nationalism? Now, as a reflex, and I urge you to think more generally as I move along, one could succumb to that false opposition that Natasha has already brought up, between nationalism and patriotism, a distinction exploited by many politicians, most recently by Emmanuel Macron, who while sharing a platform with that inveterate American first nationalist called Donald Trump, made the tacit point with great French eloquence that while he stood for patriotism, Trump was a diehard nationalist. While there is a distinction to be made here, I would argue that patriotism serves as a camouflage for nationalism. It is not a means of resisting it. So what is needed, in my view, is a distinct epistemology of the national, and I'm putting it in quotes, 
because I don't have another word for it, okay? And we have to invent it. It doesn't exist. It's an epistemology that I feel is embodied, though not theorized, by Tagore. And this epistemology, I feel, has two tasks. One is avoid being subsumed in nationalism, and two, disembricate itself from patriotism, okay? Now, very interestingly, there are very few theoretical clues for the epistemology of what I call national anti-nationalism. And the closest I've ever come to finding something useful is in the writings of Franz Fanon, most specifically his wonderful essay on national culture, which was first delivered as an address in 1959 in Rome at the Second Congress of Black Writers and Artists. This address ended with the following statement, and I make this statement with the memory of Okwi and Vizor. Quote, national consciousness, which is not nationalism, is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. It is out of national consciousness that international consciousness lives and grows. And this twofold emerging is ultimately the source of all culture. It's a very broad statement, many resonances. Even as we need to contextualize it within liberationist anti-colonial struggle, I value the tenuous distinction that Fanon makes between national consciousness, which is not yet nationalism, but which could so easily become nationalism. So I'm fully aware of the risk involved in reclaiming the national. It's not an easy matter. In a more pragmatic register, Fanon claims that it is out of national consciousness that international consciousness lives and grows. I would say that this statement is more or less in sync with Chotal Mouffe's position that while she is sympathetic to the search for micro-political alternatives on the left in global forums like the World Social Forum, she is skeptical that these arguably post-national, deterritorialized alternatives can be sustained within the mechanisms of the nation state. I would agree with that. I'm less convinced by Mouffe's pitch for left populism which she believes is the only way in which right populism can be fought. I find populism extremely dodgy because it can be on the right or, or and the left at the same time. In a more practical register, I'm not sure, and I stand uh, challenged here by the presence of many artists, I'm not sure that the art world has the necessary strategies or techniques to resist and when I use the word resist, I mean it politically, and not just at a symbolic level. Resist the sheer violence and scale of political populism on the right today. How does one begin to resist President Rodrigo Duterte's brazen execution of thousands of drug users in the Philippines, which has made him even more popular among the working classes in his country? For God's sake, this is murder. How do you resist this? How does one resist the overnight demonetization of the Indian economy masterminded by Narendra Modi, which was meant to unearth all the black money in the country ostensibly to help the poor? In effect, we know demonetization converted black money into white. While one can ridicule such consequences of authoritarian idiocy through any number of artistic and performative subversions, how does one resist its brazen violation of constitutional norms and justice. How does one find a language of resistance that goes beyond representation? It's interesting that with all the hype around populism that the popular and the national popular as formulated by Gramsci are not always taken seriously as strategies of resistance and I'm happy to see that the popular comes up in the last session. Now, when I look back in the Indian context, perhaps the only national popular cultural movement that India has ever experienced and is likely to experience remains the Indian People's Theatre Association, IPTA, from the 1940s. Now, this movement was organized by the Undivided Communist Party of India, which brought together the widest spectrum of 
artists, musicians, dancers, painters, writers, not necessarily on the left. For a brief period, they did succeed in mobilizing resistance against imperialism and fascism. In those days, you could name fascism. Today, if you dared to name fascism, you'd be in trouble. So we resort to different versions of authoritarianism, don't we? Today, it could also be argued that Ipta is a spent force and can only be invoked in the context of nostalgia, which is never productive. Nonetheless, I think what it teaches us is that if artists today are serious about resisting nationalism, which is a massive phenomenon, they cannot just fall back on their own creative resources. They need to organize a movement that works across isolated centers of art production. So what are the new strategies of organization that could sustain such a movement? What are its mediating agencies? And can we begin to think of organization as another kind of art production? Along with a new organizational strategy, I do believe that we need to introspect and do some much needed self-critique in questioning those uninterrogated liberal values that underlie our faith in freedom, democracy, and the right to dissent. While I, for one, am not ready to give up on any of these principles, and I'm sure that's the case right here, my question is, how can one develop a more reflexive critique of liberalism, which as writers like Talal Assad have pointed out, is not free of violence or social exclusion? How may we form new alliances with those constituencies of the marginalized? And I'm thinking in particular of indigenous communities whose worldviews and ecological wisdom were never part of the imaginary of the modern liberal nation state. So what may we be in a position to learn from the socially excluded? So I end with just three lines of action, which I've already talked about the need to create a distinct epistemology of the national that actively resists nationalism, the need for a new organizational strategy for sustaining art movements against nationalism, and three, the need to act on the social exclusions of liberalism through new alliances with the underprivileged, and I think some engagement with these three actions could enable us to find a ground by which we can begin to resist nationalism today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rustam. This, uh, the questions that were raised here, I think we can spend the rest of the day unpacking them. I just want to say briefly how you are uh, statement what we can take from Bauhaus and it, that it is actually not so much in actually resisting rise of what you actually also called fascism is uh, probably right but I think the question that we are also trying to address is what you can do right now with the exhibition uh, not so not with Bauhaus as such but what one can do with the format of the exhibition with the cultural production that refers to it and with this, I also want to announce our next uh, speaker, Iris Dressler, who, who will be talking about the critical revision of the exhibition of Bauhaus that, that took place uh, in 1968 in Stuttgart, and the critical revision of her project uh, happened this year. And uh, Iris Dressler is, along with Hans Chris, the co-director of Wittenbergischer Kunstverein in Stuttgart, and teaches as an associate lecturer at the Staatliche Akademie der Bildenden Kunste in Stuttgart. One of the main focuses of their joint projects is to explore collaborative, transnational and transdisciplinary forms of curating, and the project she will be talking about is one of those. Thank you very much. Please come.
On May 4, 1968, one day after students in Paris had occupied the University of Sorbonne and proclaimed the so-called May 68, the exhibition 50 Years of the Bauhaus was opened at the Württembergischer Kunstverein in Stuttgart. The opening was accompanied by protest against the planned closure of the Hochschule für Gestaltung Ulm, which was founded in 1953 as a successor of the Bauhaus project. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, so here you see uh, Walter Gropius talking with a megaphone to the students. This is the situation in Paris, and here we are in Stuttgart again. Uh, designed by Herbert Bayer and conceived by Hans Maria Wingler, Ludwig Grote, and the Kunstverein's d director at that time, Dieter Honisch, the exhibition was shown after Stuttgart in eight additional museums worldwide in Europe, the USA. Canada, South America, and Asia, reaching more than 800,000 visitors. From 1974 on, a reduced version of the show, compiled by the Institute für Auslandsbeziehungen, toured around the globe till 1982. To this day, 50 Years of the Bauhaus is considered one of the most influential post-war exhibition on the Bauhaus, creating its myth and branding. The exhibition, especially its traveling, was funded by the already mentioned Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, an institution of the German Foreign Office, and was under the patronage of German Federal President Heinrich Lübcke. For the show was of major significance in the course of the identity and a certain nation-building process of the still young Federal Rep Republic, since at stake was not least the rehabilitation at international levels of Germany as a cultur cultural nation in the aftermath of na National Socialism. The, 1986, uh, the 1968 exhibition depicted the Bauhaus as a cultural achievement of the Weimar Republic that could be built upon seamlessly after 1945, quasi through its reimportation from the USA, the exile that enabled its mas maturation. Already the title, 50 Years of the Bauhaus, ascribed to this school, which in fact, as we know, existed only 14 years, an unbroken continuity. In the opening speech, the German Federal Minister for Building and Urbanism, Dr. Lauritz Lauritzen, claimed, quote, The Bauhaus significantly has contributed to the cultural philosophy of the democratic designed state, democratic designed state, and a de democratic society. It is unthinkable without the democratic constitution of the Weimar Republic, end of quote, which, as he explains, failed because of the lack of a liberal open society. He goes on, quote, the Bauhaus was of global vibrancy without any national hubris. One can say that it is a German contribution to culture and civilization in the world of the 20th century, a contribution to the humanization of the technical century. And he adds, the men of the Bauhaus who left Germany kept the spirit of German humanism in their exiles alive. End of quote. About those who stayed in Germany, he says nothing. The 1968 Bauhaus exhibition uh, supported the narrative that all participants of the Bauhaus, which was closed in 1933 due to the pressure of the Nazis, quasi were dissidents of the Third Reich. The architectural historian Winfried Nerdinger even says, quote, after 1945, the notion that from then on was in, uh, incessantly repeated ran as follows. Anyone who made use of modernist forms during the Nazi period cannot have been a Nazi. The modernist style in and of itself rehabilitates the architect and immediately legitimize legit, uh, him as a democratic spirit or even as a member of the resistant. Since, uh, end of quote. The exhibition 50 Years of the Bauhaus must be read in the context of how Germany in the 1950s and 60s tried to overcome, negate, and forget its fascist past. And it seems that it was successful. The British newspaper Observer wrote in September 1968, quote, after the painful disasters of the Great War, the message of the Bauhaus was positive and healthy. It proposed breaking with the past and facing the future, not with grim, but with joy. 
In this sense, as also uh, the architectural theorist Phyllis, Philip Oswald has referred to, the patronage of, uh, patronage of Heinrich Lübcke, who among other things had worked during the Third Reich for building projects controlled by Albert Speer and was responsible for the use of inmates of concentration camps, is symptomatic. Here you see him uh, visiting the exhibition and making sure that photographs will underline his closeness to modernity, that is to say, to the future and not to the past. Healing, uh, uh, as mentioned in the Observer, has already been a motive for the foundation of the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm. In, in Ulm. In 1946, Otto Eicher and Inge Scholl, the sister of Hans and Sophie Scholl, applied themselves to the development of new educational models that would support the social and psychological transformation needed in Germany after 1945. These concerns resulted, amongst other things, in the establishment of the design school in Ulm, which was based on the model of the Bauhaus and supposed to, co to, contribute, uh, to contribute to the formation of a peaceful, democratic and free society, this school that was closed in the fall of 1968, despite the students' protest. Uh. Already in uh, 1930, the Bauhaus has been promoted uh, as protagonist of Germany's modern and up-to-date spirit. Um, I'm referring to the legendary section of the German Werkbund in the Exposition de la Société des Artistes Décorateurs in Paris. It was the first representation of Germany at this important French design exhibition after the First World War. And the Bauhaus, in fact this section allemand, curated by Walter Kru uh, Gropius, who had left the Bauhaus in 1928, was a sort of retrospective representation of the Bauhaus and not of the Werkbund already had the role to tell the world that Germans are not only barbarians. What the 1968 Bauhaus exhibition completely negated were the entanglements of quite a lot of the so-called Bauhäusler who stayed in Germany after 1933, among them many of this school's heroes, uh, with National Socialism, in particular in the fields of industrial construction, rationalization and propaganda. For instance, Herbert Bayer, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Lili Reich, Joost Schmidt, Kurt Kranz, uh, the Neuner Brothers and many more contributed essentially to a certain modernist appeal of the great propaganda exhibition of the National Socialists. Exhibitions which, without any doubt, promoted the fascist, racial, racist, anti-Semit, eugenic and war ideologies of the Nazis. Others, like Gustav Hassenflug, were involved with the design of industrial buildings of often disappropriated companies that served the Nazis' armaments production. Ernst Neufert, to date the global, to date, the global authority of normification and the rationalization of building, worked his way up to the task force of Albert Speer, supporting openly the Nazi ideologies and being responsible for armor logistics uh, uh, and the urbanization plans for the future East. Nothing of this was subject of 50 years of the Bauhaus. But the day 1968 also marks a moment of change. In Germany, the students' protests of 67 and later were deeply shaped by the demand to look closer at the country's painful history. The young generation, to the point of the, to the, point of the members of the Red Army fraction, started to insistently uh, ask their parents, what did, do, what did you do during the Third Reich? Concerning the Bauhaus, as far as I know, it was not before 1993 that a major academic survey concerning the ambivalent relationships between former Bauhaus members and National Socialism uh, was published. I'm, refer I'm referring to this book edited by Winfried Nerdiger and Ute Brüning. Even though these ambivalent relationships between Bauhäusler and the Nazis are known since that time, they are not part of a broader public narrative. Um, our exhibition 50 years after 50 years of the Bauhaus 1968, which took place uh, last year at the Kunstverein as a critical rereading instead of a celebration of the legendary 68 exhibition, comprised four major thematic lines. One of it dealt ex explicitly with the Bauhaus designers' entanglement with the National Socialists, 
basically in the form of a series of 17 tableaus on the history of the exhibition's design from the 1920s to the 1940s, and by a certain focus on Herbert Bayer. He was the designer of the 1968 exhibition in Stuttgart, and probably the biggest opportunist of design history. Working in the course of his career with the same creative energy for unions, the National Socialists and the US war propaganda against the Nazis. Our aim was not so much to un unveil individual positions of Bauhaus members regarding National Socialism, but to understand why and that the Nazis, in certain contexts, were eager to be per perceived from certain circles as modern and cosmopolitan. In Nediger and Brüning's uh, uh, mentioned book, Bauhaus expert Magdalena Droste wrote, quote, the Nazis had not only smashed the Bauhaus and combated its claim to modernization, they occupied the modern forms themselves and placed them in the service of national socialism. State, harmless handicrafts, folk nationalist design, conservative luxury products and modern product design were equally represented. She also wrote the Bauhäusler, who sta had stayed on in Germany during the NS period, revised their biographies and thereby joined in the collective suppression of denial and denial of the NS era that the entire country was engaged uh, in, at that, in at that time. One telling example is Herbert Bayer's advertisement for the waterproof textile of Adifa, that was the working group of the so-called German Aryan textile industry. In his 1967 uh, uh, monographic catalog, he not only retouched the references of the Aryan lobbyists, so you see here, I mean, here's the reference to this, this Aryan group, and it also says it in this uh, text. And in the book, when he, uh, so in 67, he, he reproduces, he just, I mean, here the logo is gone. And also the text is missing. But he did not only this, he also, um, um, where am I? Uh, he, he also manipulated uh, the, the date, because it says that, it, that this, in the book it says that the advertisement was made in 1930, uh, in 1930, but in fact it could not happen because this material was just um, invented in uh, 1936. So it's obviously a lie. <laughs> Um, and I'm maybe just because um, I, I show some of the example we were dealing, just a little bit of the, the example we were showing uh, to see how these, these Bauhausian aesthetics, I mean these wonderful experiments by Lili Reich and Mies van der Rohe, for example, uh, working with textiles and, and glass, etc., uh, that they could go very well with the Nazis. So this is the situation of the textile um, uh, section in, in Barcelona, 1929, during the, the um, World Expo. And here the same, it's almost the same situation, uh, but this is in Paris, 1937. So in the Nazi pavilion, in the Nazi pavilion of that, uh, that ex exhibition. The only thing which are added are flowers. Then Herbert Weyer himself, he was the designer of, of the four major uh, design, uh, um, propaganda exhibitions of the, the Nazis. The first was Die Kamera. Um, and he, he was uh, producing the, the catalog of this exhibition. It's interesting, you see, the exhibition was taking place in Berlin. That's the one he, he uh, so this, uh, that, that, that he designed. And the other one was in Stuttgart. And it's more going in this, this Nazi direction, but you see that they're taking up already some of the elements of, of modernism. So this hybridization was something that we were interested in. If you look inside, so this is the, 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 this book from, from Bayer. And you see also from the aesthetics, from the composition, from the type of photographs and how the photographs are uh, um, placed, that this is this combination of, of Nazi content and Bauhaus form. Uh, the exhibition uh, 90, in 1934, German People, German Work, um, which was one, yeah, one of the really big uh, propaganda exhibitions where the first time it was uh, all the eugenic and racist discourses promoted, uh, there had been more than 12 uh, ex-members of the Bauhaus designing it. 
um, the 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 um, catalog again and the poster were made by um, by Herbert Bayer, and you see how in this exhibition the the typical Nazi aesthetics and the Bauhaus aesthetics s somehow worked well together. And just to show you in a, in a larger um, image how, how beautiful these installations were within this really uh, highly problematic contents, right? Um, then what what um, Herbert Bayer basically produced uh, are, were for the exhibitions, besides of posters and the cover of books, etc., were these booklets, um, which were produced in very high, high copies, so that they get a, a really big distribution. And they were they are just beautiful. I mean, we had them in original. They are just fantastic, but their content is <laughs> very much uh, something different, right? Um, I just go... This is quite quite well known. It has, I mean, the, it was really very successful in the international design world. And one ask, uh, I ask myself if somebody ever read the text. Uh, here you see that that he's already starting to compromise much more the aesthetics of uh, of his um, of the the national socialists. Um, and here you see that this is not documenta. It's funny, but. <laughs> um, so this is one of the <laughs> this this was one of the the very important uh, magazine design magazines at that time, and you see that here this booklet uh, was like an insert. So it was really highly distributed. It was seen in the international design circles, and it was just uh, everybody liked it and loved it and whatsoever. And then finally, I show this image. Um, um, because of the square and the Bauhaus, right? So you have this, this as, I mean, this typical or, or this this format of the the square for the, the for, for several uh, Bauhaus books. This is the very first uh, exhibition of the Bauhaus in 1923 in Weimar. This was the one uh, in '68 in Stuttgart, and then the follow-up um, from the Institute of für Auslandsbeziehungen. Uh, these three exhibitions were the one that were designed by Herbert Bayer, and uh, the other ones were basically by by some national socialist graphic designers, but you see that they all took over this format of the of the square. Um, yes, I, I finished here. Thank you. <laughs>